back during World War II. This happened several times. At one time, I know it was uh, especially an important matter. That was in the invasion of Okinawa. Actually, the fleet that brought the invasion forces there was bigger than the one at Normandy. And that was when the Japanese suicide plane, the Kamikaze, was used more than any other place. And to protect the carriers and the troop ships, you had all these destroyers. They had a duty to perform. They were to shield the big ships, the aircraft carriers and so forth, from the kamikazes. Thus, they were positioned at particular places throughout the fleet off the coast so that they could uh, provide that kind of defense. Many of them were sunk. My uncle was on one and was killed on it when it was sunk. But they were expendable. And that's my point today. They were expendable. Even I think a movie had that, a war movie that had they were expendable. When they surrendered on Bataan in the Philippines in World War II, it was the largest American surrender ever. They were expendable. And that always causes us to think about the church. We, as members of it, are members of the army of the Lord. This brings to mind the Apostle Paul. Paul considered himself expendable. He thought he was expendable for the cause of Jesus Christ. In becoming an apostle of Christ, the peerless apostle of the Gentiles knew that his life was laid on the line for the cause of our Lord. He wrote to the brethren in Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. That the life also of Jesus might be manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. Simply showing the consequences to people who heard the gospel through him that it was a good thing. And further he wrote, and I will gladly spend and be spent for you. 2 Corinthians 12, 15. Sometimes we talk about loving the brethren. And I think you can see Paul exhibiting that love in these words that he wrote about in 1 Corinthians 13. He would say to the Romans as to his intent desire for his own brethren after the flesh, the Jews, that they could be saved, for I could wish myself a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. No man ever hazarded his life for the cause of Christ like the Apostle Paul, no mortal no person sacrificed as much. And he was determined to follow in the footsteps of Jesus in filling up the sufferings of Christ. And so these particular studies of such a great servant of God as Paul are important today for us to examine our own lives concerning our service, and maybe to ask, has my service really been sacrificial service? Do I consider myself expendable for the cause of Jesus Christ? So many times it's easy to do things and 
want to be seen of men in doing them. Jesus warned about that when he talked about the chief seats. All of us like to be recognized for something. All of us like to have a pat on the back, so to speak, for accomplishing things that are good. We want to be esteemed. And we're taught as Christians to compliment and to encourage and to take note of great service of our brethren for the Lord, to encourage one another in those things. And yet there's a balance there, isn't there? Obviously, among the Jews, things had got out of hand because of their desire to be seen of men, to be recognized, to be exalted. Our Lord said to those in the church or who would make up the church that he that would be greatest among you, let him be your servant. The world's got it all backwards. And you can see that in the way that men seek appreciation for whatever it is they do. After Paul accepted the life in Christ, thinking about how zealous and dedicated he was to the persecution of the church, the desire to destroy it, all that was turned around the other way. His whole attitude toward Christ, toward God, toward the church, toward Christians completely changed. And it came to a rather abrupt change. And he said this about himself. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. And then he makes this marvelous statement. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And do count them but dumb that I may win Christ. And I ask myself the question, how do you measure up to that? When uh, you have people using you or whatever they do to you. When you know ahead of time all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know some of that's going to come from false brethren. Well then how do you think of yourself? Now it's silly for me to say do you ever think of yourself? We all think of ourselves. And there's a proper way, a correct way, a needful way for us to think of ourselves. Examine yourself to see whether you be in the faith. We have to. It's part of being faithful. Am I being what God expects me to be since I'm his child? Notice he said, and this is the ultimate in his resignation, concerning what he said about suffering the loss of all things. Here's the reason why. That I may know him. And I made reference to this a moment ago. The power of his resurrection. The fellowship of his sufferings. Being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Philippians 3, 7 through 11. Think about that for a minute. If by any means, whatever it takes for me to go to heaven, that's what I'm willing to do or not do as the case may be. We all need to be reminded of this. We can talk about various isms that bother the church and all of the worldly bothers of the church and this, that, and the other, and various issues that arrive over time in the church. But we must, in dealing with every one of them, Approach it as Paul did. Are there things I'm unwilling to give up to serve God? Well, I promise you, if there really are, the devil will find it and he'll use it. So Paul stood ready to lay down his very life for Christ. And that, if we understand correctly from history, he did. Now, regarding this, the apostle asked, 
concerning their work as apostles of Christ. And why stand we in jeopardy, not every year or every month or every hour or every day, or I should say every week or every day, but every hour. That's what he says. Why stand we jeopardy in jeopardy every hour? He says to the Corinthians, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus my Lord. I die daily. He then, in the passage, referred to having fought with wild beasts in Ephesus, 1 Corinthians 15, 30-32. My curiosity caused me to say, what all was that about? It had to do with service to Christ that put him in that position. We know how the Romans did a lot of things, but I'd like to know more about that. What put him in that position? And later to these same brethren, he wrote these words, For we would not have you ignorant of our trouble which came upon us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure. In other words, I can't tell you how hard we were pressed. He says, Above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves. And here's what kept him going. Listen. That we should not trust in ourselves, but in God that raiseth the dead. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. I'm telling you, such principles as this in the Bible would solve a lot of problems in people's lives if they had the priorities right. In other words, how could the Apostle Paul and others like him face such trials for the cause of Christ and yet remain steadfast. Well, he knew he was expendable for the cause of Christ, to spread the gospel of Christ, to save the souls of men. And he continually walked from one trouble into another because he loved the souls of men. More than actually loved their souls themselves. And he proclaimed the gospel, God's power to save them, Romans 1, 16, to them. And suffered for it greatly. The apostle Paul's life was so devoted to Jesus Christ that he could make this marvelous statement. Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain, Philippians 1, 20 and 21. We make our appeal to people to become Christians, to believe in Christ, to obey the gospel. We plead and warn them, plead with and warn them about their obedience. But until a person can reach a stage to where I see in my death gain in Christ, they're certainly not ready to die. Paul could see that gain in Christ because of his sacrifices for Christ here. His life was so dedicated to Christ that he could write these words. Because the Holy Spirit revealed what was going to happen to him when he went down to Jerusalem or up to Jerusalem. And he made this statement, and, and now I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem. I've got to be there. Not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Spirit witnesses in every city saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear to myself, so that I might finish my course with joy. Acts 20, 22 and 24. Let me pause here and say something. In view of what we've seen so far, if I stopped right here, would you honestly say 
I don't have any room for improvement. I don't need to grow any more than where I am right now. My relationship with God is all it needs to be right now. I don't think we can hardly say so. God in his infinite wisdom showed us what a mere mortal could do when he was totally, absolutely dedicated to service to God. After this record of Acts 20, 22 through 24, uh, some days later in another city, there was others who tried to dissuade him from going up to Jerusalem because that's where the very core of his enemies were. And he replied in this way, I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Acts 21 verse 13. I've never been quite put into a situation, at least that I know of, to where my life was in danger in the way that Paul's was. I have been close to a few situations that uh, made me wonder what was going to happen. It wasn't necessarily because I was a Christian and I was going to be persecuted for that. Some of you remember the troubles, as the locals called it, in Northern Ireland back in the 70s and 80s. Where the IRA, the Irish Republican bunch from the Republic of Ireland, the south part of the island there, was warning Northern Ireland to be given its freedom and then possess all of it. So you had all that trouble. Some of you might remember that. Some of you weren't born, but uh, interesting part of history. Well, we went over preaching the gospel over there while all that was going on. I guess sometimes we were in danger and didn't know about it. <clears throat> One time, though, it was made quite obvious. The British troops were all over the place. And we stopped in this little town because we'd gone down to see where Alexander Campbell and Thomas Campbell had preached while they were there before they came to America. And we stopped in this little town to eat we were in a little, little restaurant and things moving along outside as far as the people traveling up and down the streets. Nothing was out of the ordinary and what you might see in any place until I looked up right outside the window and here was an armored car <laughs> moving very slowly down the street. There were British soldiers crouched back to back watching the windows Everybody moving very slowly down the street. You would think they were just about to be shot at, and many times they were. And I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> but everybody that I saw was going on about their business, but it makes you think. It makes you think a little bit. Then one night we were speaking and got through standing outside the rented building there in town. Banger in Northern Ireland. And they told us that just around the corner, and they took us and showed us around the corner of the block, one of the kids playing, you worry about our children here meeting some bum or somebody, had gone around and there was a shoebox sitting on the window ledge. And being the way things were then in the troubles, they rushed them away and got a hold of the authorities, and it was a bomb. Well, I've never had to face that here. Hope I don't. <laughs> Seen a few other situations sort of, sort of like that, but none of it ever came when they were coming after me because of what I'm preaching right now. And they were bent on killing me that I know of. <laughs> but it makes you think. 
Those things could have happened to people and did happen to people for one reason and one reason only. Not because of political shenanigans that were going on, but because they were simply preaching the gospel of Christ. And that's what Paul dealt with. There were no hysterics when Paul faced his executioner in Rome. And I know that because I read his state of mind that he wrote before any of that ever happened. Here's what he said not long before his death, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Almost sounds like he's going to take a plane. He's waiting for the plane to leave. Here's what he said about himself. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And brethren, here he talks about us, and not for me only, but unto all of them that love his appearing, 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. As you live right now, would you love him appearing right now? If not, something needs to be corrected. In your life, something needs to change if you're not ready to welcome him right now. John could say in Revelation, even so, come, Lord Jesus. I think every Christian, if he's what the Bible says he ought to be, should have that disposition of mind, that attitude that guides his life. You look at Paul here and he's facing death. But he was looking at what was beyond death. And he called his death my departure. And that's why Paul was willing to sacrifice his life on the altar of God's service. He knew something that made that worthwhile. And thus, we find him saying in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1, for we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle be dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now he's even looking beyond the paradise state of the Hadean world of departing spirits. He's looking beyond that to the resurrection, to the time of the possession of glory in heaven and resurrected body like his Lord had. I don't want to tell us something about this man, why he accomplished so much, and what hinders us and what we need to correct in our own lives. We forget these things if we don't watch out. We, we're too prone to keep both feet on the ground, shoulder to the wheel, nose to the grindstone, in a strained position, head bent down and all we see is our feet in the dirt Paul looked beyond the stars Paul looked beyond the physical Paul looked at his eternal reward and that's how you're saved by hope Romans 8 24 if only we would look then to the grand eternal reward that God has promised to the faithful then we would understand why Paul considered himself expendable and that we should be expendable for the cause of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it wasn't maybe as difficult for Paul to face death, especially the kind of death he died and faced all through his life as a faithful servant of God. He knew that no doubt his life lasted as long as it did because the Lord preserved him. He made this statement about his own life. We should be able to make this statement about ourselves. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me 
and gave himself for me. Galatians 2 verse 20. Can you say that right now? And mean it. And know it's true. When we've been crucified with Christ, when we realize our lives are expendable, then we will find calmness and peace of mind that will come upon us, that can come upon us in no other way just at the time that we are in tribulations and trials and beset by the ways of this world. Peace will be restored when we accept the fact that we also are expendable as Paul was expendable. You know, the Lord talked about those that lose their life shall gain it, and that sounds so strange. Well, that's what he meant. Exactly what Paul was saying. When you give your life to God in obedience to the gospel, you're converted to Christ, you're a new creature in Christ, then this world is not our home and we're just passing through. All that amounts to anything to us and that's really important to us is beyond this world and outside of this world. Sometimes in funerals, in fact, most of the time in any that I have anything to say about or speak about, I'll point out that regardless of the state of a person, the person that's dead, if he or she could come back right now and speak to us, it would be be obedient to Christ and live faithful to him and use up your life in serving him. Because everything else is going to be gone. I think I love history about as much as anybody, but all that stuff in history is all going to dissolve, so I know its place in my life. God saw fit to reveal and bring about the scheme of redemption down through time and history. It's important to understand some of that. Maybe for things in this life, that's important. But whatever it is in history, that we experience personally, none of it is going to get beyond this life. We leave it all when we die. But what have we sent ahead? Well, look at Paul. What do you think he sent ahead? Jesus had said, lay up treasures in heaven. I don't know that we can begin to grasp the treasures Paul has laid up in heaven. But we have to be making those deposits in the bank of heaven while we're here. And that's the point of this lesson this afternoon. When we expend our life in service to God here, we're laying up treasure in heaven. We just talked about how many times has that song been sung. I've got a mansion. I don't have much here. I think we have to watch out sometimes how we say that. Because I think in comparison and contrast to the rest of the world, we have a whole lot here. Compared to heaven, no, we can't really compare what's here with heaven. But when you go back to the first century, there were a host of those brethren who had nothing but their hope of heaven. Do we have too much of this world's good that our hope in heaven is really just not that strong? I'll tell you a prayer that's on my lips about myself and for everybody else, especially my brethren. That if there are people who need to repent of their sins and are not doing it, may they be most miserable. May they be wretched. And may they not find any peace. And may that drive them to obey the truth. That's a prayer that's on my lips and has been for a long time about myself and about my brethren.
I want the church to be strong. I want members of the church to be faithful. But until we come to grips with what life's all about and how it is that we are expendable as members of the body of Christ for the cause that there can be no greater than the cause of Christ, then I don't know that we'll ever get the answer to a lot of our prayers regarding the blessings we would have God put upon us. Because those blessings that you read of, those beautiful attitudes of Matthew 5 and the Sermon on the Mount, come from a people who knew there was nothing here for them. Not ultimately and finally. And as Jesus said, and the poor have the gospel preach to them. As we close the lesson, think about these things. Think about what it takes to grow and to develop, to be in the likeness of Christ. Our connection with the affairs of this world, and are we expendable, and are we living as if we are? If you're not a child of God, we hope you'll obey the gospel this afternoon. We urge you to do that. As a child of God, if you need to repent of sins, we urge you to do that, and confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. We ask you to do so now while we stand, while we sing.